things happened to me that completely changed the trajectory of my life. Everything that unfolded from there led me to this red dot right here in front of you. But before I tell you about that, I have to share three secrets about you. Now you are all here because you followed a specific playbook, a playbook of success. Secret number two is this playbook of success is not going to mirror your life at many points in your life. And the third secret is the day you are willing to rewrite this playbook of success, that is the day you will start to walk the path of your highest calling. Let me explain. So you are all here because you were handed a playbook of success by your family, your friends, your life experiences. Based on that, you decided who to hang out with, what to learn, and what to hold on to as important values. This playbook of success is so fascinating, it has the next 20 years of your life charted out for you. It tells you exactly who you're going to work with, who you're going to marry, how many children. Heck, it even tells you when and where you might be retiring to. Based on this playbook of success, you decided what your KPIs, your key performance indicators were going to be. And you achieved them brilliantly. And along the way, there were many aspects of your life that you tossed aside as not valuable, not important, not now. So here you are, students of one of the top universities of India with a playbook of success, a secret playbook of success programmed in your brains. I too had a playbook of success. I too hung out with the right crowd, got good grades, won performance awards, but the years of my life I spent living by the rules of that playbook were the most unfulfilling times of my life. My life began to open up and I began to thrive the day I did this to my playbook. This is the story of the person who inspired me to rewrite my playbook. And that brings me to the second secret about your playbook. Many times in your life, what you have written in your playbook will not mirror your life. And that is a great thing. Seven years ago, I was events manager at North America's most iconic spiritual bookstore. It was my daily pleasure to be working with the who is who of the self-help world. The likes of Dr. Bruce Lipton, Dr. Deepak Chopra, world-renowned speakers, New York Times best-selling authors. But for me personally, the most exciting and fun part of my day was interviewing psychics. Who here knows who a psychic is? So for those who do not know who a psychic is, a psychic is a person with extraordinary abilities to access information about you that is not ordinarily available through the senses. So when you think of interviewing someone, you think of asking them questions like, what are your biggest strengths and weaknesses and where will you be five years from now? That's not how you interview a psychic. When you interview a psychic, the psychic gives you a reading. The psychics I interviewed would tell me about my past, my life, my past lives, my potential future, as a way to impress me with their ESP, their extrasensory perception. To be honest, majority of the psychics I interviewed were just clever storytellers, but not Edward. <coughs> Edward told me many things during the course of our meeting, most of which I have forgotten. 
But here's this one thing that remains etched in my memory. Edward said, your great grandmother is always with you. I did not believe him. Then he said, she is quite a character. And I thought, well, anyone born before the 1900s has to be a character, right? <coughs> then he said, she does not keep covered, pointing to his chest. My jaw fell. How did Edward, a regular Californian dude, know this about women from Kerala from a hundred years ago? That everyone from the Queens to the women working in the fields and everybody in between did not keep covered. Everyone wore unisex clothing, a white mundu or dhoti, and did not cover their chest. This is very normal and environmentally friendly in many tropical beachy parts of the world, like Java, Indonesia, Polynesia. In that instant, I knew Edward had seen my paternal great-grandmother. My paternal great-grandmother was my guardian angel. Even though my paternal great-grandmother had passed away long before I was born, I always felt a special connection to her. Growing up, I was told I resembled her. She was fondly nicknamed Ponnamma, the golden one, because she was visibly radiant like gold. In my mind, I have always called her Goldie. So for the sake of our storytelling, we are going to call her Goldie. Now, if my family had a hall of fame, there would be freedom fighter Kunjil Velaithan, who marched the salt satyagraha with Gandhiji. There would be Kunjan Panikarashan, great grandfather, renowned Ayurveda physician. There would be Dr. C.K. Kavyur Revama, world renowned Carnatic musician. There would be R.P. Lalaji, a pioneering founder of the Kerala's techno park. And in the corner, hidden in the shadows, would be my Goldie Grandma. Now, all these names, and you might think I come from a family of privilege. Quite the contrary. My grandparents were from a community of untouchables. So they had to be extraordinary times 100 to reach where they did. Now, coming back to Goldie and why she was on the wall of shame, and not in the Hall of Fame. And why, in spite of that, she is still my hero. Now, Kerala has had an unbroken tradition of Ayurveda healing from the 6th century onwards, when Acharya Vaghata traveled all the way from Sindhu Desha in Pakistan to Kerala with Ashtanga Hridaya, his seminal work on Ayurveda healing. From those times, Father physicians would train their sons in the art and science of Ayurveda healing by helping them memorize shlokas or verses from the Ashtanga Hridaya. Daughters too would be taught verses if they were found to have the enormous intelligence and the right auspicious lakshanas, signs. My grandma Goli was from such a lineage and she was married to an Ayurveda physician as well. When Goli was in her mid-thirties, great-grandfather passed away after a horse riding accident. After that shock, Goli fell seriously ill and could not recover even though she had the best of care at home. Now in those times, a Hindu family would take their sick to a hospital only as a last resort because all the hospitals were run by missionaries. And the missionaries would not treat unless the patient converted their faith. This, to Dharmic Hindu families, was like a death. Goldie, too, was taken to the missionary hospital and left there. Her family fully knowing never to see her again. But here's what happens, and this is the plot twist. Goldie pulled through and returned home. On top of that, she never converted. She remained a Hindu bhakta till the very end. And on top of that, 
she somehow managed to convince the British surgeon working at the missionary hospital that she was an Ayurveda healer and not just an Ayurveda healer of any kind, but an Ayurveda healer worthy of respect. And after that, when she regained her full health, she did something unimaginable. She started to make daily visits to this missionary hospital. Apparently, the British surgeon had started to train her in Western medicine with a focus on midwifery. The family naturally was in uproar and opposed her fiercely. It was dangerous for a woman to go walking all alone to such a far distance. It was shameful for a woman, especially a widow, to be leaving her home. And this is Kerala from a hundred years ago, when segregation and persecution were a daily reality to those who were at the lowest rung of society. None of this stopped Goldie. The 1930s rolled in, and the world was at the brink of war and depression. India was seething with revolt against the British, who had colonized India barbarically for over 200 years. Hordes of British were leaving India, and the day came when the British surgeon too packed his bags and boarded a ship to Mumbai. But before he left, he did something incredible. He gifted Goldie with his own personal physician's medical bag. Now, a physician's leather medical bag is not just an expensive piece of equipment, it's his pride, it's his most prized possession, it's his identity. And from then on, it was like Goldie was on fire. She started to make rounds of her patients like a man. She started to go when called, day or night, like a man. Goldie lived well into her 90s and served the villages around her with her ancestral wisdom of Ayurveda. I would love to tell you that I have been inspired by Goli all throughout my life and I would be telling you a lie. For the longest time, I disowned my own heritage and chased after other metrics of success in my original playbook. A title, a compensation, a desirable address. But the day I began to walk in Goli's footsteps and started to learn and heal with Ayurveda, my life expanded and gained momentum. I was chosen as an ambassador by Kerala Tourism and Ayush Ministry in 2018. My expert quotes began to get published in publications like Washington Post, Healthline, and Mind Body Green. Business leaders, billionaires, IT executives, top IT executives of Silicon Valley began to trust me with their health and well-being. And this brings us to the third secret about your playbook. The day you are willing to rewrite your playbook, the day you are able to have the courage to rewrite your playbook, is the day you begin to start walking on your highest path of calling. Now, why is this important? You see, in a simple terms, if we explain how this looks like, we take our playbook and we parse it apart. We start to look at what parts of our playbook is written by us, our soul's calling. And what parts of our playbook has things others have put in, no matter how loving and well-meaning. Remember, you are here to sing your song, to do your dance. And just like there are no two leaves alike in this universe, your path to your highest calling, your path to self-actualization, is uniquely yours. For tens of thousands of years, self-actualization or moksha has been our ancestors' number one goal. We have always believed in the pursuit of our desires and prosperity with our dharma, our faith, 
firmly on our side with an eye to the end goal of moksha. And our ancestors have left behind not one, not two, but thousands of books raving about their favorite ways of serving up moksha. The Shastras and the Samhitas of Vedas, Vedanta, Itihasas, Puranas, all of these. Why was moksha or self-actualization such a big deal for our ancestors? Remember how Goldie became unstoppable once she found her calling? This is what happens when you are on the path of your self-actualization or moksha. And remember how the British surgeon treated her with respect as an equal? This is what happens when two people walking on the path of their highest calling meet. They recognize each other and all differences of gender, caste, color, hierarchy, race falls away. The path to my self-actualization is the ancestral wisdom of Ayurveda. Because our ancestors knew without a shred of doubt that self-actualization was the ultimate equalizer. Self-actualization is the ultimate disruptive path to change. I invite you to find your path. Namaste.